Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to my presentation. My name is Paul Zauchner. I wrote this paper together with Markus Kettler and Harald Unterweger, and we are all from the Graz University of Technology. Today, I would like to present you a method how to predict accurate reloads on train runway girders by strain measurement on the railings of existing runway cranes. In typical overhead bridge cranes, as you can see it here in the right hand sketch, there are local vertical stresses introduced to the girder by concentrated reloads. These local stresses are often crucial for the fatigue design of the runway girder. So the knowledge of the acting dynamic reloads would improve a realistic prediction of the remaining fatigue life of the runway girders. So the target is to calculate the reload F out of measured vertical strains here in the rail's neck via strain gauges. The measurement of vertical strains has a couple of advantages. For example, the measurement can be performed on any runway crane as they are independent of the girder's shape. Also, the application of strain gauges is less work intensive than equivalent measurement methods. Laboratory tests are executed to check the feasibility of strain measurement in the rail neck and also to figure out the magnitude and the distribution of the vertical strains. Three test series are carried out with different bedding of the rail's bottom surface to figure out the influences on the measured strains. In test series one, the rail is bedded on a rigid supporting plate. This is called the reference case because there are no influences of the vertical stiffness on the, rail, uh, on the strain distribution in the rail. In test series two, the rail is bedded on a hard road eye section profile HAB300 in order to simulate a rail on a crane girder. And in test series three, the rail is also bedded on a rigid supporting plate, but with an additional elastic bearing bed in between the rail and <clears throat> the supporting plate. All test series are carried out for four different rail types, all of the shape A, with a length of 400 mm. The load was applied centric, beer and cylindric steel segment to the rail. The strains are measured in, in vertical direction via strain gauges on both sides of the neck and rail's half span. Calculating the mean value out of the two measurements would avoid measuring unplanned eccentricities caused by non-ideal rail geometry. In the sketch, a side view of a rail is shown during a test. For load application directly above the measuring point at rail's half span, there is a symmetry plane for the strain distribution in longitudinal direction in the rail neck. Moving forward the rail during the test and measure, uh, measuring the strains always at the same point at rail's half span would simulate a crane crossing and allow to measure a kind of influence line for the vertical strains epsilon set at the measurement point. So by plotting the, measuring, the measured strains for each load position over the distance between the load application and the measurement point leads to the strain distribution for the load position where the load is um, applied above the strain gauges. So the diagrams show the strain distribution determined in this way for a rail A75. As expected, the maximum strains are found directly under the load and their magnitude depends on the stiffness of the bedding. The difference between strain gauge 1 and strain gauge 2 shows that even with a perfectly centric load application in the laboratory, unblend eccentricities occur. The next step was to idealize um, the experimental setting as 3D solid finite elements models where the strain distribution on the outer surface of the rail's neck are calculated numerically. In the diagrams, the mean values of the experimentally determined strain distributions are compared with those of the finite element analysis. It can be said that the behavior in the laboratory can be well produced or well reproduced with the finite element method. For determining the strain distribution in the transversal direction of the rail neck and also to figure out influences on the maximum strains at the measurement point, additional numerical investigations were carried out. The following figures show exemplary some results for an A75 rail, where the strain distribution in the rail neck is plotted in both in longitudinal and in transversal direction. In the longitudinal direction, this, the plot starts here at the symmetry plane below the wheel load. 
it's shown that the maximum strain value of the two-dimensional strain distribution is always on the next outside where the measurement point is. In the figures, the calculations of the rigid bedded rail are compared to those with an exemplary crane girder T1 and both calculations with additional elastic beds. It can be figured out that the transversal strain distribution decreases the lower the bedding under the rail is, while in the cases without elastic pad a significant influence of a girder is determined, these effects are compensated completely in cases with bearing beds. In comparison between the reference case and with and without elastic pad, um, there is a completely different behavior of the strain distribution in the longitudinal direction. This leads to the need of two different concepts for calculating the wheel loads with and without elastic bearing beds. In order to avoid these effects of the crane girders in cases without elastic beds, it is recommended to measure the strains at the supported point of the crane girder reinforced with transfer stiffness where the rigid bedding can be assumed. The next considered parameter, which is shown here, is the rail rear, which is defined with an abrosion of the rail heads of 12.5 to 25%. The diagrams show the same blood of strain distribution, where now an increase of the maximum value with higher rear is to be recorded compared to the rigid reference case. So on this slide now, the first concept for calculating wheel loads in cases without elastic bearing bed should be presented. The figure shows a schematic sketch of a rail with an horizontal cutting section through the neck at the rail's measurement point, with the maximum strains here under the wheel load. So the equilibrium in this cutting section is that the rail uh, wheel load F should be equal to the two-dimensional integration of the vertical stresses in this cutting plane. For solving this equation approximately, several assumptions were made. As a first assumption, the numerical calculations have shown that the stress distribution can be calculated approximately directly from the strain distribution with, by multiplying with the Young's modulus of the rail. The strain distribution is approximated with well-known functions. For the approximation x direction, this displayed function here was chosen, which integration leads to this very simple form. For the approximation in transversal direction, a constant fusion is was a constant function epsilon set m was chosen, which is calculated. Um, by multiplying the maximum strain value with a factor alpha b, which is representing the ratio between the maximum and the mean value over the thickness of the neck vm. Based on these assumptions, the wheel load can now be calculated with the formula given here, where the factors c and alpha b can be tabulated and, are, and only are, depends on the rail type. <clears throat> The factor Ka considers the mentioned increase of the maximum of the strains at higher rail rear. Because this formula was derived from the rigid reference case, it is recommended again to measure the strains at the supporting positions of the crane girder reinforced with transverse stiffeners in order to be able to neglect effects of girder's geometry. If this is not possible, a simplified con con uh, consideration derived from the fi finite element calculations is given here using this factor kt, which depends mainly on the thickness of flange's girder, uh, of flange and web of the girder. But this is only a first simple approximation and will and, and had to be further investigated in future studies. The next slide should present concept two for cases with elastic bearing beds. In this cases, due to local bending of the rail, there is no longer a linear conversation between vertical stresses and strains, but a plane stress state. These plane stress state must be known at least at the measuring point, which means that both horizontal and vertical strains, epsilon z and epsilon x, has to be calculated has to be measured and the vertical stress has to be calculated through the plane stress plate. 
In this method, also, a second stress value, sigma z1, at a certain distance x1, is needed to calculate the approximation of the stress distribution. Due to lack of time, I will not present um, the approximation for this concept, but, <clears throat> uh, but the procedure remains the same as for concept 1. I liked, I'd like again to refer to the paper mentioned below for more information to this. So the approximated functions now lead, lead to the display, displayed formula, which is now more complex than for concept 1. In the formula, the value x1 can be set to 100 mm for each rail type. The value sigma z1 can be calculated simplified out of the ratio to the maximum stress value for each rail type or calculated by a second strain measurement at the distance x1. The limiting length L of compression stresses is determined with the formula shown here on the right side. This formula was derived from a continuous only in compression elastic bedded bar. All other parameters can be tabulated as in concept one depending only on the rail type. For more information, please, again, I would refer to the publication mentioned below. So it's shown that the um, calculation of the acting wheel load out of measured strains in the crane rail would be possible with the two concepts which, which are presented now. So for concept one, for cases without elastic bearing, that's the calculation of the actual wheel load would be possible by measuring and calculating the mean value out of two measured vertical strains at one position at the rail snap. In this case, the influence of rail abrosion has to be considered and the measurement should be carried out at the place of the crane girder where we have the support reinforced with transverse stiffness in order to neglect all effects of a crane girder and where um, a stiff bedding of the rail can be assumed. For the concept two, for cases with elastic bearing beds, the calculation of the acting wheel loads would be possible um, if we measure both vertical and longitudinal strains in, uh, at one or maybe two positions at the rail neck. Also in this case, the influence of the rail abrosion has to be considered. And we have, to cons we have not to consider influence of the girders geometry because they are compensated by the bearing beds in this case. Finally, I would like to say that additionally cabri calibrations with tests of rear crane run girders with known accurate reloads in the future seems to be necessary to improve this method for practical applications. So thank you for your attention.